Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you can look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, it reads, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over, go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then when he returned, my so when he said, and then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them, fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he said, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Let us pray. Dearly Father, I want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for us to grow, learn, to ask ourselves hard questions, for you to reveal our hearts, for us to be able to learn from the situations and the people at hand. God, what I do pray for right now is that you will watch over this sermon, the hearts, as that every meditation of our heart is according to your glory, that everything that we're here for is not for ulterior motives, but we are here because we want to give you glory. Um, I pray for my heart that every word that proceeds out of it is for your glory, that all people will see is a projection of your glory. They won't even see the preacher, that they will look at your text and see the beauty of who you are, see the redemptive story of the fact that you are always here for us. God, as we get ready for the celebration, even though we should be celebrating every day, as we get ready for the celebration of your resurrection and your death, I do pray that we will prepare our hearts accordingly. So God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. While you are sitting, and let me at least set the preface. Usually when you read this text, you read it for the, the viewpoint of Jesus, right? Because we often have to use the Garden of Gethsemane for us to understand the sacrifice. Today, don't be mad at me, it is not contradictory, but it is truthful. I am going to use the disciples' side of the story. So if you don't mind, let's catch the vantage point from the disciples' side. And I hope that you will be able to switch your mind over. It's not that I'm skipping over the text, but I am focusing this pericope or the subject matter on the other characters. So if you are used to it being preached a certain type of way, I am going to hopefully challenge you to open your heart and mind, not to see it ulterior, but to see it for the totality. Hmm. I will say this. 
How many of us in this room doze off places? Okay, I, I know this is the veteran crowd. <laughs> so sleep hits you in a number of different ways. How do I know this? I watch pastor all the time. <laughs> that you end up watching TV and the TV ends up. So I know that some of y'all, not all of y'all, I know some of y'all are young, have a tendency to doze off. You have a certain spot on the couch you know what's fixing to happen. Now, I'm not fixing to be sexist in any way, but how many of y'all already know when you start the movie, you fixing to go to sleep? How many of y'all already know that you pull the blanket to a certain spot on your shoulder and you're going to go to sleep? And then you tell your significant other, your, your spouse, oh, this going to be good. It's our cuddle night. Knowing <laughs> you're going to sleep. And then your husband has to endure or your wife has to endure you saying and denying the fact that you're going to go to sleep. Like, babe, you're going to go to sleep. No, I'm not. Oh, here we go. But we don't mind dozing off. But I think some of us have even dozed off on our faith. That we're used to Jesus saying, hey, you're going to stay up with me tonight, aren't you? You're going to pray, aren't you? You're going to read your Bible, aren't you? And you're like, I'm going to pull the blanket up a little further. Some of us already know we sleep at the wheel. Some of us already know we're at church today, sleep at the wheel. Now, I'm not even talking about your heavy eyes that we'll talk about in a second. I'm not talking about the fact that some of us, can, I'm talking about the fact that some of us don't recognize the privilege it is to be in intimacy with God. I'm talking about that some of us, you know, we, we often take it as a compliment when I can do this in my what? We take it as a compliment when we say I can go to work and I could do this in my, but that's not how your faith should be. That some of us have learned how to do our faith in our sleep. Some of us are at church and mentally sleep. That our hearts are sleep. That you think nothing is going to change your situation. Nothing is going to change your mind. Nothing is going to change what you do. But you know how to get up, set your alarm, and go to sleep. Today I want to wake you up. Today, my prayer is that you'll see the disciples' side, and maybe you'll be sympathetic. I pray that you're even empathetic to the disciples, that you'll realize the humanity of who they are, but then you'll recognize Jesus' questions. You'll recognize what he is asking them. You'll recognize, and then you'll say, am I asleep at the wheel? Right here in verse 26, he, there's some beauty to this text. And I pray what you will do is you will decipher it with me. I pray that what you will do is you'll actually exegete it with me. Because if you see it from the vantage point of being different, it's not that I won't highlight our Jesus, but I want to ask how many of us are asleep. Now, watch what happens. It says, then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane. And watch these words. And he said to his disciples... Sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, recognize the first thing you're going to separate is he's talking to all of them. Judas is already gone. And watch these words. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So I want you to get the mental picture first. That his disciples, he says, sit here. Didn't give them any responsibility. He just says, sit here while I go over there and pray. But then he took three more with him separately. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So the question you should be asking is, why did he only take three when he had a total of 11? Then you should be asking yourself the same question, am I the three? This is going to get deep. That some of us know how to follow Jesus, but we're not intimate with him. Some of us know how to read our Bible, but there's no intimacy when you read. But he took three individuals that have been standing up for him. He took three individuals that often were the ones right behind him. He took three individuals that were often the ones conferring with him. He also took three individuals that thought they had a high place with him. We'll explain that in a second. Well, he also took three individuals that were the ones that claimed... They will stick with him through thick and thin. So when you read the text, I want you to ask yourself first, am I the three? Would Jesus even invite me to come a little bit further? Then I want you to ask a secondary question. 
How many of us are over there sitting with the other disciples because you refuse to come a little bit further? See, I don't care if you're 8 o'clock service saints. I don't care if you woke up a little earlier and you got dressed a little better. What I am asking, would Jesus ask you to come a little bit further? And how many of you are denying the ability to come further? What I mean is that God has been calling you a little bit closer. But you're like, you know what? I'm comfortable here. You have to ask yourself a simple question. How do the other eight feel? Because you never hear a complaint. That means they were comfortable sitting here and not even worrying about what Jesus was fixing to do. Now, I don't know how many of y'all right now are not worried about what Jesus is fixing to do. But if I were you, in the intimacy of God, wouldn't you want to be as close as you can to the action? Or how many of us are close or good at sitting on the sidelines? I've come far enough. I've tried hard enough. My marriage is where it's going to be. My job is where it's going to be. My service in the church is where it's going to be. My ability to listen to the sermons for 55 to 65 to 75 minutes is where it's going to be. I'm not going to study it later. I'm not going any deeper. I'm not going any more intimate. I'm not going to even advance my faith. I'm not going to learn more. I'm not going to go to OBA. I'm not going to even try. I'm cool sitting here. And then he has three more that got to go a little bit further. And we, let's give you the name so you don't keep saying the sons of Zebedee. These are James and John. So we have Peter, James, and John. Why is that important that I give you the names? It's going to come up a little bit later. How many of y'all ever noticed? Well, let's just keep going. Well, Peter, he, he's there. But why is Peter's name mentioned individually at first? Now, Matthew is the only one to do that. Mark actually gives you the names up front. I think if you were to read this text and exegete it well, you would recognize that Peter gets his name called because Peter's also the one that said what at the Lord's Supper? I will follow you wherever you go and I will never deny you. Peter, we fixing to single you out. I like Matthew. Matthew like, nah, fam, we got you. We got you on record. If you are young enough to know what I'm fixing to say, the heat, Matthew's showing the screenshots. Now, if you don't know what I just said, it's when you take a picture with your phone and then you show the person, now you said you was going to be here at 1130. It means I got the receipts. So what Matthew was saying is what? I got the receipts, Peter. You said this, and I want to highlight your character. So even though we're going to talk about Jesus, let's start off by talking about Peter. How many of us have said, Jesus, I'll go wherever you go? I'll never deny you. And many of us think about the denial that came when? When he went to follow Jesus. That is true. That was what Jesus was referring to. But then you have three opportunities for them to stay awake today too. And I wonder how many times you're going to see this text and realize the beauty of the text that three times I had an opportunity to stay awake. Then I look at some of us and say, how many of y'all have said, Jesus, I'll go wherever you go. And he's given you three opportunities to stay awake. Stay awake in your marriage, stay awake at your job, making sure you stay missional, making sure you're a light at your job, making sure you're the husband you're called to be. And three times, even though you said, I'm going to be the husband, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to stand up in church, come to the altar, you have fell asleep every time on Monday. Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, but let me get a little bit closer, because the two sons are not exempt. And I want you to get this because I love the fact that he allowed three to come because three people had three different storylines. Now follow me, it's just like a good movie. So Peter said he won't deny. You already know the story. But then you have, who we have? James and John. Now go back with me just for a second. Go all the way to Matthew chapter 20 and go to verse 20. This is going to get good. Remember I told you, Jesus knows what he's doing. Verse 20, we have Mama Pauline up in the picture. Chapter 20, I'm sorry. Chapter 20 of Matthew. He said, then the mothers of the what? Sons of Zebedee. What did she ask for? Came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine, mama's boys, may sit on your right and on your left. But Jesus answers, you do not even know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? Watch the answer, ladies and gentlemen. We are able. Now let's go back to the story. He 
he tells them what's fixing to happen. But before we even get here, he tells them what's going on with him. And let me read it with you if you don't believe me. And began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Oh, Lord. Let me ask you a question. You know me, I like to ask questions. It's not like Jesus didn't tell them what he's going through. The question is, is do you care? Jesus tells us what to do in his scripture. It's not like he doesn't tell you what's fixing to happen. The question for many Christians is, do you care? Because he's saying, hey, I'm fixing to go into this thing. I'm fixing to go pray. My soul is deep in grief. If I'm intimate with you, wouldn't I grieve with you? Wouldn't I be like, whoa, Jesus, why are you deeply grieved? You would think there would be some follow-up questions to your leader, the one you said you love, the one you've asked for preferred treatment, the mama that came and asked, Peter, who said he would not deny. All these three people said that we're closer. We're in your inner circle. We are wanting to be intimate with you, God. I want to be in the inner circle. I want to be more preferred than the rest. They over there sitting. I'm over here in your inner circle. Wouldn't you think? That they will be like, well, wait, Jesus, why are you grieved? Wait, wait, Jesus, wait, whoa, 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 slow down. You've never been grieved before. What's going on? Let me be alert. He gave him a couple of responsibilities. So then I asked you really quickly, do you care enough to know what Jesus wants from you? Because it's not like he ain't told you. See, here's the issue with discipleship is disciples will only go as far as they want to. Because you have free will. And what I have found is that many disciples in our faith, many disciples in Christianity, only go as far as they want to, and they can care less about the things God's told them to care about. How do I know that? Find somebody on the side of the street that Jesus said, take care of the poor. And how many excuses do we come up with not to help the poor? We'll even throw our resume. I remember when I was poor and I made it. You don't see me on the side of the street. And I'm not saying you should give to every person on the side of the street. What I am saying is, are you compassionate to where God told you to be compassionate about? Let me get a little deeper since nobody. He says, be a light no matter where you are. Be missional. That means on your job, you still have a responsibility to be missional. There is no way you can go on your job and not share the gospel. Let's make it a little more personal. There's no way you can go to the same auntie's house, take her food, but not give her the gospel. That some of us just got comfortable not doing what Jesus told us to do. Some of us know how to be a good wife and how to be a good husband. Some of us are like, I'm going as far as I want to go. I told you what I'm deeply grieved about. I'm deeply grieved about this world and sin that is in this world. I'm deeply grieved at the fact that I'm fixing to die for your sins. I'm going to take 39 lashes. I'm deeply grieved that I'm fixing to bear the load of humanity, but most importantly, carry the sins of the world here, past, past and, and in the future. I am deeply grieved about it. Are you? So when instead of you watching the news and saying, mm-mm, 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 they tripping. Are you grieved about the sin of our world? Does it activate you to want to do something different? Does it at least keep you up and alert? Or some of us are just like, you know what? I'm good. I've gone as far as I want to go. Uh, how many of y'all have ever fallen asleep? Or let me say this, stop paying attention on the road. It's just, just a little blink here and there. Ugh. But because our country is, I guess you would say, somewhat intelligent, they have learned to put down some strips on the side of the road. Now, it used to be so it could wake you up. I think it's now just because people be texting. Right? Watching videos. I mean, everybody's doing something on the road. But when you get too far to the left or too far to the right, you hear what? Brrr. That's supposed to what? Wake you up. What Jesus is saying is like, hey, disciples, here's your wake up strip. I'm trying to wake you up. Something is fixing to happen. Here is the noise you need to hear. And the noise you need to hear is my voice. 
But he says, my sheep will know my, my voice. The problem is, are you going to wake up? How many of us are sleeping through the wake-up strip? How many of us are still texting, say, I'll redirect later? How many of us are still too far to the left where you're so far on the left, you, the wake-up strip is gone? Your whole tires are in the shoulder. Because we have learned to sleep through things. How many of y'all sleep right now? This sermon is your wake-up strip. He says, what does he tell them to do? Here's the thing. You can't say they disobeying if you never told them to do nothing. Right? Like, like if he just said, hey, just chill real quick. I don't care if you fall asleep or not. I just need three bodies. I'm cold. Stay here. No. He told them specific instructions. He says this. Keep watch with me. Oh, this is beautiful. The word keep watch is repeated throughout the New Testament, but is often repeated for a couple reasons. One, the word keep watch means to stay alert with me. And when he says stay watchful, but also be what? Alert to. Man, when you get to the end of the story, some of us are going to be laughing. Because what he asked them to do is exactly what he needed them to do. No more or no less. Meaning you're not going to be able to walk into the garden with me. You can't handle the burden I got to carry. Isn't it beautiful that God is not asking you to carry his burden? So I'm going to do this twofold for you real quick because we have some overzealous Christians that are trying to carry things that ain't theirs. Some of us think we the Savior. Now, you like, Pierre, no, I don't. How many of us are trying to save people only God can save? Oh, you know I'm going somewhere. That some of us are walking all the way in the garden with Jesus. You're like, no, I told you to stay here. You can't do what I'm fixing to do. And even if you tried, you couldn't carry nobody's sin. You can only, and you can't even handle your sin. This is only for me to carry. But I need you to do your job. Only your job. And your job is to what? Stay awake and keep alert. If you ever follow that scripture throughout the New Testament, you would realize that that stay alert is often applied to the Christian faith, that you should be alert of the, the what? The things of Satan, the weapons of Satan. You should also be alert to your faith, making sure you are alert to what God has called you to do. I'm going to give you some cross references just for you that I want you to understand that when he says be alert, you got later on in the text, you have 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Colossians 4, 2, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, and it'll all be in your notes because I love you. And I can't slow down. The reference for that he's telling them to do is saying, hey, I need you to pay attention. You know, the reason why many of us make callous mistakes is because you're not paying attention to your own faith. Some of us are too busy looking at somebody else's faith. It's not the fact that you sleep. You over there comparing your life to somebody else. So you over here distracted. When God is like, hey, no, keep alert about your faith. Then worry about somebody else's. You out of line already. You know how many counseling sessions I've been in where somebody's worried about the other person, but their life is jacked? I can't believe he would. So I cussed him out. Whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> but it's funny. When you start to talk about them, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't come here to talk about me. I came here to talk about my husband or my wife. Pay attention, sir. And I'm like, I am paying attention. You cussed him out. Let's talk about that. Because the last time I checked, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. Ma'am, your mouth, your heart is dirty. <laughs> Let's leave that out. Pay attention to yourself. But I love this about God. He's not asking you to do more than you can do. Their job wasn't even that hard. It's hard because we'll get later into it. The flesh is weak. We'll get there. You have a valid excuse, and many of y'all are going to be like, you're right, Pierre. I deserve to be sleepy. I don't want to make you feel bad, but then let me give you a second part. So we talked about the characters. We're in it, right? Then he tells them what to do. We're in it, right? But then he 
I want to give you one more cross-reference into the word be alert and watchful. It's also, and we're going to turn here, say it with me, eschatological. Ready? Eschatological. The study of the end times. So he's not just asking them to stay awake and pay attention for their own selves. He's asking them to stay awake because something is coming. Now, if you cross-reference backwards, you would start to say, what is he asking them to do? And when we get to the end of the text, you would realize, man, if they would have just stayed awake, they would have prepared themselves. But let's just turn back for two seconds because I want to at least give you the beauty of the text. Look at just chapter 24. Just turn back a little bit. How much time does he spend telling them of signs of the return? 24. He tells them about the signs of the return. Then it talks about 29, the glorious return, if you just want to read your subtitles, just for the sake of it. But then he gets to verse 42 of the same chapter, and guess what he says? Therefore, be on the alert. So this word is what? Popping up everywhere. That God is not asking you to pay attention just to your faith. He's asking you to pay attention to the end. Because if you pay attention to the end, you'll stay awake in the present. I'll give you some heads up on that. If you hope that Jesus returns and you haven't fallen in love with this life, then you will be excited about his return. So you'll stay awake in your present because you don't know when he's coming back. So therefore, you will be, I guess you would say, alert and watchful in your marriage, in your life, in your singleness, because you're telling God, I'm alert because I have no idea when you're coming back. But if you get comfortable, you're going to go to sleep. And it's because some of us are sleepwalking through our faith. We're not realizing that if Jesus comes, like he said he comes, in a twinkling of an eye, because you weren't alert, you didn't do what he told you to do. The reason why some of us haven't done what we're supposed to do is because we've taken it a day at a time. We just sleepwalking through our faith, and God's like, okay. Have you ever heard when he talks about the slave, he said the slave started doing what? Stopped doing his labor. But then he said there was a diligent slave who every day got up and did what he was supposed to do. And when the, the slave master came back, what happened? He was rewarded because he kept doing what he was supposed to do. Go back a couple chapters. I guess my point is every day you wake up, you should be doing what you got to do. Be alert and watchful because a day is coming. I think one of the ways Satan gets us all is if he can make you comfortable. See, everybody tries to do the Satan technique, right? They're like, oh, Satan just throwing me temptation. Sometimes the biggest temptation is just to be comfortable. If he can give you just enough money where you're not struggling and need Jesus. If he can give you just enough in your savings account where you don't need Jesus, we get very comfortable. And some of us have learned to fall asleep because we got an emergency savings. So we wake up, set our alarm, we do our thing, we go to work, we're faithful at our jobs, we make sure we get that check, we get back up, we do it again, and all of a sudden your life becomes repetition. So one of the biggest techniques I think Satan should ever give is just make you lazy. And how do you make you lazy? Give you everything you want so you don't got to work no harder. Some of us are like, oh God, and bless me with a lot. And sometimes I'd be like, sure. But I also think Satan ain't dumb. If he gives you just enough... You'll go to sleep. Sometimes I wonder if the disciples got so comfortable that even though their master, their Lord, their Savior, the one that just fed 5,000, the one that fed 4,000, the one that raised people from the dead, the one that they seen it all, and you had no desire to do what he asked you to do? Something got to be asked about the disciples. And something has to be asked about us. Did we have the wrong perception of what discipleship really is? Because they did. They were excited about Jesus' reign on earth. So they were like, yeah, we'll make it until you become king on earth. So we'll just hang on because you're supposed to bless us while we're here. They got comfortable. But if you were to say, no, I'm going to reward you in heaven. Oh, you ain't comfortable then, because that means you work on earth because your reward is coming, not you work on earth because your reward is present. When you start thinking eschatologically, you'll start realizing, man, I'm only working today because the reward is in the future. But some of us only do the work so we can get the blessing in present. That's why when a preacher preaches about present blessings, we all get up. We sing a song about present emotional reward. Guess what we do? We all start singing. 
But if you are only singing because one day you get to see your Savior, you'll never go to sleep. You'll stay up all the time. You'll be vigilant in your faith. You'll be diligent because there's an eschatological coming. Oh, y'all didn't think that word went that deep, but today I told you we're going to take it apart. Because not only that, but he comes back. And what I would love for you to do is pay attention to the words. He says, keep watch with me. And he went below beyond them, and he prays the prayer we're all in love with. He says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Many of us have taken that prayer and said, man, I love that prayer. I pray that we pray that ourselves. And it's not that I'm skipping over it. It's just the fact that we're going to see what happens to the other characters. And he says this, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. Some of the commentaries I read were like they shared none of his burden. They had an opportunity to partake in his grieving and said, I'm good on it. That they were asked to partake very minimally. But watch who he starts talking to. There was some solidarity that was supposed to happen, but watch, watch this word. Remember I told you this word matters. And he says to who? Who did he talk to? And said to who? There's three people there. But he turns to Peter. This is what I love about Jesus. Jesus remembers stuff. He got them receipts. Because Peter, a couple of verses ago, said what? I'll go wherever you go. I'll die with you. Brother, you can't even stay up. And some of us, when we got saved, remember when we were stuck in sin? We thought our marriage was over. We thought our singleness was over. We thought our life was over. Some of us were on hospital beds saying, God, if you could just get me out of here. And we started telling God everything we was going to do if you kept us awake on earth. But then he says, hey, can you just be present at church? Can you just serve the body? Can you just partake in what I've told you to partake in? Could you just stay awake? And God we look at him and say, God, I know I prayed that prayer of desperation, but that's over now. I'm comfortable again. You got me out of the hospital. You saved my marriage and you saved my singleness. And now I'm living this good life and I got this good job. So let me go back to sleep. I was asleep before I got here. You saved me. Now I'm going back to sleep again. Sometimes I look even as I do church work. And I wonder if I could look at our associate pastors, our deacons, and our elders and say, how many of us can sleep through church? We've done it our whole lives. We have been rewarded. People have told us we are the ones that are responsible for the church. And that we have gotten so good at our jobs, it becomes a job. That we can fall asleep at the wheel, and that includes me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not exempt from falling asleep in discipleship. That many of us have fallen asleep because we can even get good at God. We can even get good at serving in the same ministry for 20 years, never asking yourself if you want to change ministries, never saying, is God elevating me and pulling me into the inner circle in solidarity with him? No, 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 no. We're like, I'm good in my spot. I have an assigned seat in church. How do I know that? I can find every one of y'all. <laughs> I know exactly where you are. I took off my glasses, wake up, you're still in the same spot. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> now I'm joking. Signed seats are really cool. I, 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 I grant it. I love them. <laughs> I'm glad you feel comfortable in church. <laughs> but what's my point? I, a pastor at the end of service, he says, um, find somebody you don't know. When's the last time you found somebody you didn't know? <laughs> When's the last time you fellowship with somebody at your house outside of the people that you have in your comfort zone? When is the last time you say, you know what, my service needs to expand. I've been doing this long enough. How many young ladies and men do you have under your belt? How many people are you discipling? Because last time I checked, he said, go and make disciples. How many, when is the last time you shared the gospel with somebody that was not in your comfort Christianity zone? When is the last time you popped your Christian bubble? When is the last time you loved on somebody that thought totally different about this world? When is the last time you sat down, sat down with somebody who was homosexual and said, let me tell you that Jesus still loves you? 
Let me tell you that Jesus can save you too. Let me tell you about the goodness of God because Jesus saved me too when I was out in this world doing some Yankee stuff. And I can tell you, when is the last time you said, I'm going to challenge my faith or are many of us just sleep? God gave you your prayer request and you went to sleep on it. Some of us are sitting in your prayer request right now. Some of us prayed for our husbands and our wives to come to church with us and to sit in solidarity with us. And as soon as it happened, we were like, I'm good now. God, you brought them here. The last time I checked, your only mission is not your marriage. If that's the only mission you got, that's pretty small. Church has become about marriage, singleness, and children. But let's move on because then he puts some parameters on Peter. I love Peter. Peter, Peter, a fool. So you men, he goes back to all three, could not keep watch, watch these words, for one hour? Sheesh. It's not like he was gone for two days. That man was gone for an hour. This is what I love about God. God don't sleep. And how long did he pray for? An hour. You know the prayer vigil that everybody skips on Tuesday? You know that's actually something that exists? Where you spend an adequate amount of time praying before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So when you read this hour, guess what you're reading about? Jesus went into a prayer vigil. He said, I'm only going to pray. There's nothing else. There's no sermon. There's no nothing else. There's no, it's just me and God. I'm going into intimacy with my father and I'm going to do it for an hour. Most of the times they were done for three in the Old Testament. He only went away for what? One. He told them to keep alert and stay awake while he went to prayer because the last time I checked, he prayed before he was fixing to die. The only thing he asked them to do is stay awake with them. One hour, these people couldn't stay up. But I want you to be sympathetic to my people. I, I, you got to remember the night before this. They stayed up a long time. They had a slumber party. Not really. They had the Lord's Supper. But it was a nighttime activity, if we remember correctly. And they had the Lord's Supper. That means they were probably full. Y'all know what happens when some of us get full. But then he goes, then he changes the instruction. Are you ready with me? We're going to get to this next point really quickly. It says, keep watching and praying. The first time he says what? Keep watch with me. Then he asked them if they will do what? Not only watch, but pray. I love y'all. But how many of us use the snooze on purpose? Just raise your hand with me in solidarity. There we go. There's nothing wrong. You just had your confession come to the altar. Just... But how many of us know we're going to snooze the first one? Just raise your hand in solidarity real quick. You already know. How many of y'all set the second button, right, just knowing that you're going to skip the first one? I'm here with you. So let me just say this with you before some of y'all feel judged. This is a judge-free zone. This morning, I set two alarms. One at 6, the other at 6.05. That five minutes is glorious. Some of y'all be feeling like that five minutes is three hours. Like, oh, Jesus, I just needed that extra five. We've all been there. Today, I think God knew I was preaching on sleeping. This is not exaggeration. This is exactly what happened. I hit snooze, knowing the second one was coming. Turned over in bed, hit that double snooze. Yeah? Looked over, like we all do when we panic. <laughs> We're fully awake now. I love Jesus because sometimes he'll set the alarm and he'll wake you up for the first time. But many of us felt the nudge of God. 
We heard the alarm of God. We know he said, wake up. Wake up in your marriage. Wake up in your evangelism. Wake up in your light. Wake up in your job. Wake up in your service. Most importantly, wake up, church. And we're like, "Ah, five more minutes. Today is your day to wake up. This is your snooze. There's no more time. Watch what happens. Look at your story. He says, pray with me. How can we all skip a prayer vigil if God is asking to pray for the people that we need to pray for, pray for our country that is obviously struggling? How can we skip those opportunities even in our privacy of our own prayer life? Because if you ever look at the definition of prayer, which I don't have time for, it is a petition to God. It is you going to God and saying your very needs, but it's also recognizing your limitations. See, the problem with prayer is it often conflicts with your pride. Hear me. It's the reason why some of our prayer life struggles because we're too prideful to recognize what we can't do. Because the last time I checked, when you recognize what you can't do, you give it to somebody else. The beauty of prayer is it conflicts with your pride. It recognizes your own weakness, recognizes the need for a higher God and higher power to do something you can't do. Secondly, it's an opportunity for confession. For you to recognize that you fell asleep a couple times. To recognize that you haven't been on your game. To recognize that everyone in here is a sinner has made mistakes. To recognize that you need somebody that forgives you. And to recognize your sin in a safe place. But if you are too prideful self-righteous, many of us haven't confessed our sin in a long time, and I'm not talking about to a pastor. Because he's going to point to the fact that this is a spiritual thing, but some of us are depending on the physical thing. How do I know that? Watch what happens next. He says, keep praying that you may not enter into temptation The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why did he tell him now? He said, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, you're sleeping. I get it. Here's your snooze. Here's a second alarm. Let me wake you up. But this time, let me give you instructions on how not to do it again. That's what I love about God. That sometimes you'll come to church and hear a sermon you just needed to hear because he's trying to say, hey, you were asleep. But let me tell you how not to do it again. He says, pray because your spirit is actually willing. This spiritual exercise of prayer will keep you alert to the temptation. Temptation is only an occasion for sin. What is temptation? It is the occasion. It is the opportunity for you to fall into sin. It is a presentation of what you really want. And what is God saying? Because your teacher told you what to do, your desire to go back to sleep is a sin and is a temptation because I already told you as God, you're not supposed to do it. So this is a sin issue. He's saying you have an occasion. I'm not, watch these words, I'm going to go back into the garden. You have an opportunity. Oh, when Jesus did what? The transfiguration, they all had an opportunity. Because Jesus is physically not walking with us, some of us have had an opportunity. In the privacy of your own lives, some of us have engaged in sin because there is an opportunity while he goes back and waiting for him to return. And he's saying, hey, you're, you're going to have another op. But in a way for you not to fall into your opportunity of temptation, the way for you not to get back into pornography, the way for you not to get back into looking at women the wrong way, the way for you not to go back into your homosexual ways, the way for you to go back into the things that you've called your needs, your drinking, your smoking, the thing, the ways that you keep saying that I have, the first thing you need to recognize that your spirit is willing not to go. The question is volition. The ability to act on one rather than the other. And he's saying, I need you to pray. One of the first steps to denying your own flesh is a recognition that you have flesh in the first place. Stop acting self-righteous. You are not God. You know why I know that? It's because many people, just because we, there's preachers, right, that they think the preacher can't fail. We have the same flesh you do. And if you ask many of our wives, you, they would tell you. 
he's a decent preacher, but he, he got some work to do as a husband. How do I know that? It was just Friday. And I just came home. It was a 60-hour week. And I heard my wife's voice, and I'm glad she's not here. I won't use this as a second service. I heard her vigilance on the phone. Fellas, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I said, she said, I said, she said, baby, what you doing? I said, oh, I've been in meetings all day. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Was she really? I don't think so. I said, babe, what you doing? Uh, I don't know. Now, remember, I'll be honest with y'all. This is not me just bragging about my wife. I I don't know how she finds things to clean. The house is clean. But she was like, our house needs a deep clean. God bless our hearts. So immediately, I looked at my clock. I was like, bro, she started at three. That means I get off at four. That means she'll still be cleaning at five. But the problem is she started naming all the things that needed to be cleaned. Things that she cleaned on Wednesday. I got home. And she was already cooking dinner. It's amazing. Kids are moving around the house, cleaning with her. So I'm like, maybe I escaped the dungeon. She was like, it's a beautiful day. Trap. (laughs) Trap. Straight trap. I knew it. She says, let's eat outside. Yes, ma'am. I tried to use the allergy speech. It didn't work. Tried sniffling right in front of her. (laughs) Allergies are horrible. (laughs) Go outside. We eat. And all of a sudden, I saw her look to her left. But Monica doesn't do small projects, y'all. This girl saw her whatever box, planner's box, decided to take every pebble that surrounds the pebble box and take it out, put a whole new tarp down, and put the rocks back. While she's doing that, now, brothers, I'm going to tell you my secret to marriage. You don't have to do it. My rule of thumb is if my wife is up, I am up. That means if you're cleaning, I'm cleaning. The problem with that rule that I set 17 years ago Because I didn't think I'd be working 70 hours a week. (laughs) So I got to follow my own rules. So I go over there. I was like, baby, what do you need help with? And I didn't really say it like I wanted to. And she was like, no, baby, go rest. That doesn't really mean what I think it (laughs) means. You've had a long week. Go relax. I I almost took it, y'all. But I knew what I knew. So I guess what? I went and grabbed a shovel, started scooping out them dumb pebbles. And then my son, yeah, they dumb. And then my son <laughs> starts helping. And then my other son comes. So I was like, man, all right, they on it. I got the pebbles out. Cool. I said, baby, what's next? She was like, nothing. I'm, I'm going to mow the lawn later. <laughs> Fam, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> now, man, you already know. First, my manliness, my pridefulness is like, I'm not going to have my wife mowing this lawn. So what do you do? I go mowing the lawn. Now, watch what happens next, y'all. The story don't end. I got to finish, though. Maybe I'm just venting. Y'all just going to have to own this, okay? (laughs) Then, all of a sudden, I see my son come to the garage, and he grabs a little weed and feed machine. So I just finished mowing. And I was like, all right. My allergies flaring up, it really was this time, because I, I, I'm allergic to grass and pollen. It's not a good mixture. And all of a sudden, I see my son rolling off, and I was like, son, where you going? Mom said, it's time to put the weed and feed down. I said, oh, God bless. <laughs> so I took the bag, dumped the weed and feed in, and immediately went into prayer. See, prayer. <laughs> prayer works. And then she tried to talk to me while I was doing the weeding feed. And I was like, dearly Father, I thank you for your grace, your mercy, your, the opportunity to be a husband, God. Thank you for the opportunity to be an example to my sons and my daughter. She was like, how you doing, babe? Don't ask. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> we failed too. 
Our flesh is real, y'all. The last time I checked, you feel me right now. Some of y'all feel me like right now. Some of that happened this morning. And he was like, nah. But then he says, your spirit is willing. If you go back up a couple verses, what did he say? Not my will, but thy will be done. What is Jesus wrestling with right now? As fully God and fully man, what is he saying? I don't even want to put the weed and feed down for these people that ain't going to even appreciate it. I don't even want to mow this lawn in his flesh, but his spirit. See, it's the inner man versus the outer man. It's the flesh saying, I don't want to be a good husband, but I am going to be a good husband. It's the flesh saying, I don't want to be a good single, but I am going to be a good single. It's the flesh saying, I don't want to help this person because they're always asking for help, but my spirit is willing. It's the fact that I don't really want to do this in the church, God, because I know I got a fool with a woman that always tells me what I really need to be doing, but my spirit is willing. But how many of us are obedient to the spirit and how many of us are going to keep going with your flesh? How many of us have a fleshly marriage expecting spiritual results? How many of us have a fleshly single life and expecting godly results? Talking about where my man, where my woman, uh, you know, live in the spirit first. You'll find a spiritual man and woman. You keep finding these fleshly folk. Hmm. See, I love that Jesus is white now at that time setting an example while asking his disciples to do the same thing. Flesh has its weaknesses, but the spirit doesn't. But then he tells you, even if you want to apply this to the Holy Spirit, but this spirit, as you could tell, is in a lowercase s. He's just talking about inner man versus outer man. He's not necessarily even talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not present yet. So what is he trying to say? But for us as Christians, what can we say? We have the inner dwelling of the capital S, Holy Spirit. So therefore, we should have what? God indwelling us to empower us to do righteousness. So therefore, we really have no excuse. We just have a free will. Now, I love about that. No excuses, but a free will. But we're almost done, ladies and gentlemen, whether you believe it or not. He went away a second time. Don't you love three times? It says he went away a second time. And he tells my father, if this cannot pass unless, a wass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Oh, you got to love God. Again... This, this little second point is quick. He came and found them sleeping. So he hit the snooze, woke them up, said, hey, let me give you an instruction not to do it again. But then he, tell, then he gives you the humanity of the disciples. What did he say? For their eyes were heavy. See, staying up with Jesus as he prays upon hour upon hour is a spiritual practice. Coming to church and serving is a what? Spiritual practice. Going to do what God has called you to do is a what? Spiritual practice. And if it is a spiritual practice, you can't depend, watch these words, on your flesh. Because the word means that he had, watch, a physical weariness. Now, you're like, man, they're human. And that's what I love about this text. You're human. But that's also the problem with the text is you can't lean on it either. Because some of us are trying to practice spiritual practices using our fleshly strength. And the reason why some of us are fatigued with church and fatigued with sermons and fatigued with the length of sermons and fatigued with this, and I'm tired of living word, I'm tired of her, I'm tired of him. Because it was never supposed to be done under your fleshly strength. Some of us have quit things because you depended on your, flesh, your fleshly strength. And God's like, I've never wanted you to do this righteous life according to your fleshly strength. The last time I checked, I gave you the Holy Spirit to help you so you wouldn't depend on yourself. Some of us are tired, but not because the Spirit isn't willing. Some of us are tired because you haven't walked in the Spirit. Because if I were to go to all the spirit texts right now, it talks about walk, be guided by, be led by, I mean, be filled with. That's just four things I could pull out of the text right now that the Holy Spirit can do for you. Some of us came here tired, not because God ain't able. You came here tired because you've been trying to do it by yourself. But this time is different, y'all. The 
because he left them sleep. This is either a sign of grace, which it is, but also a sign you've made your decision. How do I know this? Watch the rest of the text. And he left them again. Did he wake them up? Did he talk to them? Did he give them more instructions? Did he tell them how not to fall asleep again? He said, I already told you how not to fall asleep again. There's nothing else I can tell you. I already told you how to live this single life. I already told you how to live this marriage life. Pierre and Pastor Ken has already done a marriage series. We already did a giving series. We already did every series known to mankind for 29 years. You know, but you still sleep. So sleep then. Now remember when you as parents, for those who have grown children, when you came back in the room and they cuddled themselves back up, if they went back to sleep and you let them, it's not because you were like, oh, they're tired. You knew the consequences were going to be worse. You were ready when they woke up. The chore list got longer. But this one ain't that. There's no revenge for their disobedience. They just overslept. But watch what happens as we conclude. He went away to pray a third time, saying to them once more, Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Now he changes the word. Y'all been asleep. You notice he said what? Sleeping twice. Now he's saying y'all in a full slumber. Do you know when you overset the second snooze? You in a full rest at this point. He's saying you're resting now. Behold, watch these words. The hour is at hand. Oh, man. And the Son of Man is being portrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. So what's happening right now? Judas already sold. Judas already did his deed. If they were alert, they would have known. If they were alert, they would have been awake to see. If they were alert spiritually... He already told them that one of the disciples was going to betray him. They just didn't know what hour it was going to happen. But if they were alert, the scripture that he already told and warned them about was fixing to come into fruition. Some of us are asleep and we've overslept our warnings. So now the hour is at hand. We have overslept our warning signs. We have overslept. And now our marriage is on the brink of divorce because you overslept for 10 years. Now your singleness is on the brink of pregnancy because you overslept for four years. Now your lust issues are in a really bad problem. Now you have an addiction to pornography because you've been oversleeping for 20 years. You thought it was just me and God. It's just me and me and my own sin. Nobody's getting hurt by this until your wife finds it. There is things that we've been sleeping on. And God warned you, told you, even gave you instructions how not to do it again. But because we chose to rest, don't be mad. That you overslept, now you waking up in a hurry? Have you ever noticed when you wake up in a hurry, you forget stuff? Have you ever realized that when you wake up in a hurry, you don't remember what things you were supposed to remember? You don't do the things you were supposed to do? Coffee don't taste the same? Why? Because now you're not prepared. There's a reason why alarms exist is so you can prepare to get ready to go. They had no preparation time. They just had to wake up, rub their boogers, and go straight to, to meet Judas. Here's the funny part of the story, ladies and gentlemen. This is where I'll conclude. Because if Peter was paying attention, and he listened to the instruction, and he heard Jesus at the Lord's Supper about a betrayer coming, and if he would have paid attention when Jesus told him he was fixing to die, and that was a part of the plan. Do you think he would have cut off somebody's ear? No. Because this is a part of the plan in the first place. Some of us are cutting off people's ears in our anger and our frustration thinking that this is the fleshly response. I'm going to cut it off. But if you were awake in the first place, some of the damage we've caused people that Jesus now has to fix 
He has to now pick up the ear off the ground and put it back on, even though you did nothing to stop God's plan. It's because you were asleep at the wheel. Some of our marriages have the ears cut off. We ain't listening no more. We come to church, but we don't listen no more because we are doing this in our own flesh. Peter was like, you know what? I can solve this with my flesh. Watch this. And God's like, Peter, that wasn't it. I warned you already. And I wonder how many times God is looking at our marriages, our singleness, our jobs, our, our light, our evangelism, our service at church. And he's, that wasn't it. I warned you already. You know what I love? I wish the church would hear this message as a whole. Because you know what's being woken up in our churches? How we weren't even necessarily close to God in the first place. Because the moment politics became a God, oh, we, we fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Look at COVID. People ain't came back to church yet because we fell for it hook, line, and what? Sinker. Oh, we can watch it online? That's church. No, it's not. That's a review. I wish the church could see this message because we are a sleeping giant. The problem is when we woke up, we saw something we liked on the outside and our flesh was very much caught off guard. We're chopping off people's ears left and right. Moving on. You know what I love about alarms? How many of y'all sleep are next to somebody that you want to nudge? Now, I'm giving you the permission to nudge this person. Just, I mean, give them a nice Christian nudge. Just, this is you, baby, okay? Or how many of you know somebody like this that sets their alarm but can sleep through it? I mean, literally, just be like, man, man, and the, the person on the other side of the bed be like, fam, just, fam, you... You got to go to, fam, you got to go to work. And then we have to be their alarm clock. We have to say, babe, you're oversleeping your alarm again for the 17th time in this week. And the 80th time in our marriage, you are oversleeping your alarm. Thank you, brother, for your honesty. Thank you. We come to the altar later. (laughs) What I think is happening, I think the church is asleep. The whole world hears the alarm. Sin is running rampant. But the church is like, "Mm, five more minutes. I wonder if some people in your house know you sleep. They hear your spiritual alarm going off. They're trying to wake the husband up. Can you be a man of God, please? Can you be a man of God, please? Please. And the wife is begging you to lead. And then you have women and the man is like, please be the woman of God. Please be the woman of God. And everybody's trying to wake you up. But you sleep while God's trying to ring your alarm. Today is your day to wake up. Some of us sleep at the wheel. This is your strips. Some of us, the alarm has went off multiple times and you keep hitting snooze. Today is your day. Tomorrow we get to celebrate. I mean, next weekend we get to celebrate Jesus' action. The whole point of this, and I'll stop, is that Jesus still did his job. That's the whole moral of the story. This is what I love about Jesus. If Jesus was like, man, if y'all sleep, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Ain't none of us would have got this. But you know what I love about the end of the story? Is Jesus still was ready, even when you're not. <clears throat> so today, if you choose to wake up, the good news is that my Jesus is ready for you to come back. My Jesus still died, still did his job even while people were asleep at the wheel. That's your hope, is that even while some of us are asleep right now, my Jesus is wide awake. Can we pray? We're excited that you have joined us, and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart, and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here. You can find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.